Geoquit, hello. Welcome to the podcast series of the Center for Irish Studies at Villanova University. My name is Joseph Lennon, Emily C. Riley, Director of the Center. And I'm Jennifer Joyce, Associate Director and Curator of this series. We appreciate the support from our many donors, especially a generous grant from the Connolly Foundation. This podcast series aims to reflect aspects of Irish studies through the nine different academic disciplines that are taught through Villanova's Center for Irish Studies. Our faculty and students will engage in discussions with distinguished thinkers, artists, writers, academics, political leaders, and other campus visitors. We are very excited for our second season of this podcast. Our episodes this year explore current issues about race and dive into traditional song and story. Thank you so much for listening. And if you are looking for more Irish Studies events, please join us virtually this year for a rich menu of programming. You can follow us on social media, find us at our website, or email us at irishstudies at villanova.edu. Hello, Dee Eve, and welcome to the latest episode in our Villanova Irish Studies podcast series. I'm Sira Murta, Assistant Professor of Irish Politics at Villanova. And in this episode, we speak to leading figure in the Northern Ireland peace process, Professor Monica McWilliams. Monica is interviewed by five Villanova students who've been studying her peace building work this year. Gia Beaton, Abigail Blay, Danielle Burns, Runa Anastotter Neely, and Caitlin Pensabene. In a really wide ranging and thought provoking discussion, Monica talks to us about the current state of the Northern Ireland peace process post Brexit, including challenges relating to transitional justice and gender equality. And she shares with us her thoughts about some of the lessons that the US can learn from Northern Ireland's experience, particularly around police reform. It's a great discussion and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, my name is Gia Beaton and I am a recent graduate of Villanova University. I just got my Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science. This podcast was inspired by the Northern Ireland Villanova University's Center for Irish Studies Symposium that they had a couple of months ago titled The Northern Ireland Peace Process After Brexit and also Dr. Murtaugh's Master's Class on Political Science in Political Science on Politics and Divided Societies and her class on Narratives of Gender and Conflict. And we studied Professor McWilliams um, in those two classes. So it's just an honor for her to be here. And so Professor Monica McWilliams, the woman of the hour, she led the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition's negotiating team in the multi-party peace talks leading up to the Good Friday Agreement. Professor Nick Williams also co-founded the Women's Coalition, a political party that became a signatory to the peace agreement in 1998. Currently, she serves on the Independent Reporting Commission on the Disbandment of Paramilitary Organizations, and she is also the recipient of the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courtesy Award and holds honorary doctorates from several colleagues and universities. So now I will turn it over to my colleagues before we get started so that they can introduce themselves before we get into our conversation with Professor McWilliams. Hello, my name is Caitlin Pensabene. I'm a recent Villanova graduate. Um, I just graduated my bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a minor in Irish studies. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Runa Anastoto Neely and I am uh, just graduated with my master's in political science from Villanova University. Hello everyone, my name is Danielle Burns and I too just graduated with a master's degree in political science from Villanova University. And my name is Abigail Blay. I am currently studying political science and Spanish at Villanova University. Um, with that, we can get started. Um, so the first question is, knowing what you know now and in light of the aftermath of the Good Friday Agreement, is there anything you wish you and the Women's Coalition would have done differently during the peace talks to balance overall national peace with specifically women's inclusion and rights goals? Well, thank you very much, Abigail, for that question. And indeed, there's lots of things if I had to go back to the table, um, I would insert. But it's always easy to say that you can put hindsight um, at a table in the years that pass. And 23 years have now passed. But there are some things indeed. First, we put in some aspirations into the negotiations. One is the right of women to full and equal political participation. And in fact, it remained an aspiration because there wasn't a guarantee in any of the constitutional arrangements that we were agreeing. 
and it fell off the table um, and it was seen left political goodwill. So there was no affirmative action attached to it as is the case with women at other peace conflicts that insist on quotas or on um, like a 50% quota, 40% quota for women in political parties or in the future governance arrangements. Um, and that's a benchmark. And they also uh, put a timetable also to some of those proposals. So I guess I would put a timetable to the proposal on the Bill of Rights. Again, it fell off the table. I was the chief commissioner later and, and tasked um, and mandated by the Good Friday Agreement to produce the advice on a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. And I did that and presented it to the Secretary of State and to the Prime Minister UK government in 2008. And it has sat in 10 Downing Street ever since. Again, it fell off the table because there was no benchmark or timetable or indeed a guarantee that the UK government would legislate. And now with Brexit, we could potentially be left without the European Convention rights, although we haven't left those rights. The UK government is currently reviewing those rights. And we do not have a Bill of Rights. We do have a Human Rights Act that incorporated the European Convention, but it's in danger now as a result of Brexit. And we have left the European Court of Justice, which was another safeguard. And certainly as a woman, I know it was a safeguard in terms of bringing in the equal treatment directives. And we are now questioning as women what's going to happen uh, to some of these equality directives, particularly in a country of conflict. Um, so for that reason, we need to continue to be very vigilant in protecting the rights that we have and to build on those that we should have under a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. And there was also a potential for a Charter of Rights, which I drafted, which was not judiciable, but was a declaration that the rights, no matter whether you lived in the northern part of the country, in the six counties, or in the south, in the 26 counties, it didn't matter where, if you crossed the border, you were still entitled to the same rights. That now has raised its head because Ireland will remain in the European Union. It has not been affected by Brexit. And we, on the other side of that border, will be out of the European Union. So that charter is also extremely important and we should have put it on a timetable and we should have brought it in and implemented it. So what I learned was that you can make promises in a peace agreement, but those promises need to be delivered. And what you then need is oversight. You need a validation process to ensure that each of the recommendations in the agreement or the proposals and clauses are implemented. And that's where the international community comes in, as I say, our international champions. The European Union played an, an enormous role in that and um, promoted four peace programmes and gave us billions of dollars in peace funding to build the peace process. The United States did the same through the International Fund for Ireland um, and, and actually um, promoted really good practice examples of what should happen to those who might fall behind with a peace dividend. In other words, the young people, the disadvantaged communities, those most affected by conflict. And that's now raised its head again in terms of the, those groups feeling excluded and not seeing that they had a role in the peace agreement or its implementation. Um, so the implementation process is as important as the peacemaking process. Um, and that's what I learned. And the importance of building trust. Um, the process was an inclusive one, and hence the Women's Coalition got elected because it was an innovative electoral system. Um, and we did back channels. We talked to those that no one else would talk to. You don't, you know, you have to make peace with your opponents, your enemies. If war is made by enemies, peace is also made by the same way, by sitting with those who were formerly your enemies. Um, and now we talk about people being opponents, which is much better language. But have we really made people feel included? Um, and that process needs a lot of attention. And some of the groups who were armed groups um, disintegrated and some refused to accept the agreement on the Republican side. And another group went broke the ceasefire. Um, and we advocated in the Women's Coalition that all of us who were party to the problem should be party to the solution. And, the, and that did not happen. And people fell away and we worked hard to make sure that they were still in the tent. But the two governments and, and the parties that then managed to get into power were no longer that interested. 
Um, and civil society also lost out in that the Civic Forum, another proposal from the Women's Coalition, fell off the table. And at civic dialogue, as you will know, in the States, and particularly around Black Lives Matter, and many of those issues that have ended up being problematic over issues of identity, that civic forum would have been the space and place where um, a dialogue could have continued alongside the legislative body. So for all of those reasons, I think it's really important and a very, very good question to ask. Um, what would you have done differently? Peace did make a difference. It, it, it saved our lives and the lives of my children, and we're living in a much more peaceful society. But is, is it a sustainable peace? Um, and did those who should have benefited from the peace dividend really benefit in the way that we had meant them to be? And those are the questions we're still asking. And of course, there are circumstances that come from left stage that you could predict, like leaving Europe and hence Brexit, and hence the need to get back round the table and do what we did in 1998 um, and start talking again. So I'm really glad you brought up the idea of inclusion and including different groups in, um, these, in these negotiations and these peace talks. I know Danielle actually had a question um, specifically about police reform and inclusion in that space. So Danielle, if you want to take the floor on that one. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so based off your answer and just the historical context, we know that the role of women, especially the Women's Coalition, um, has really been essential in the Northern Ireland peace process. And it's become explicitly clear in its value into, into uh, society as a whole. Um, as police reforms become a more pressing issue, do you believe that police reform should distinctively consider the role that policing plays in the lives of women and girls? So kind of taking a gender lens when we're talking about the different types of reform um, and when they're being considered at uh, certain tables? Um, absolutely, there should be a gender lens. I'm currently writing my book, it's called Stand Up and Speak Out. And I went back to look at some of the reforms before the peace agreement. Um, and the police had to accept that they needed to have women in the predominantly male, predominantly militaristic uh, police force. The very word would tell you police force, that the focus was on terrorism as they saw it um, and not on the wider issues of equality. Um, and so women were not being promoted and they were actually stood down. And so we took a case way back in... Um, the late 70s uh, to the European Court where the chief constable had said he didn't want women um, because they wore skirts and it would be inappropriate for them uh, to be wearing trousers and have to carry guns. So it was better that they didn't um, be employed as full time. And so he stood down an entire contingent what was known as the, the reserve. Uh, we won the case and we won the case on the grounds that the um, equal treatment was as important as any security issue. He perceived women to be a risk um, and that the men would have to protect them and that they might even not be able to, to um, secure their guns and they might lose their guns and all these silly arguments. Today, the women are there um, as a result of the reforms in the 1998 peace agreement. Um, they, they have increased their numbers from, they were a small number of about 6% um, and now they're well over 30%. Um, and that was also the case for Catholics that, who were also underrepresented in the police. There was a quota only for religion and not for gender. And we actually spoke out against that. Um, and it said that all future recruits, 50% of them had to come from the Catholic community. And we said if the quota is good enough for religion, it should be good enough for gender. Um, but the, the reforms did benefit women. And what we said in the peace agreement was that there had to be a transformation inside the police system itself, inside the criminal justice system. Um, I've completed many reports on domestic violence, so I spoke with that lens and said that there were a number of things that needed to change, um, particularly the attitudes towards women, um, and the police had to take domestic violence much more seriously, and sexual assaults. And so a whole programme started around that in terms of training. And the issue of too many guns, which you're familiar with in the United States, and I raised that and I said that if this conflict is to end, we need to take the guns out of this equation um, because the place was awash with weapons 
um, given the proportion of the population. And it was femicides that were the consequence. Not just those who were killed in the Troubles, but those women killed in their own homes, because far, far too many were allowed personal protection weapons because they were in the police, they were taking the guns home, or they were prison officers, soldiers, and anyone who was identified even in the building trade with the security sector. So you can imagine how many guns there were. Um, and I did a study comparing the number of deaths and uh, in Northern Ireland compared to other regions of the same size, and ours was way over the average figures. So that did change. Um, and we still are the only region actually in the UK with an armed police service. And I hope one day it will return to the same as Ireland and the rest of the UK. You'll all find this very strange to have an unarmed police service. Um, but the very word service tells you that they are public servants. And their service is as, um, as much about supporting women in, as victims. Um, and I coined the phrase along with others of domestic terrorism. And the domestic terror that the women were facing to the point of murder uh, was coming from men known to them. And the same in relation to sexual assaults. Um, so we put those arguments forward in the decommissioning debate. And I once raised my arm and said, not all arms are imported, meaning that these arms um, can do, do as much damage and hence the need to change the mindsets. Coining the phrase, let's decommission the mindsets as well as decommission the guns. Um, and that's, that combination of changing attitudes also helps to change the practice and the culture. Um, and there was a very strong militaristic culture, very toxic masculinity going on, as is the case in any culture, but exaggerated in a conflict society. Uh, and so the police went through a lot of training in relation to this. And it's surprising maybe for you to hear that and there's only one person has been killed in the context of policing in the last 23 years. Just one person. And that um, particular death was over, um, reviewed by our police ombudsman, which I would urge the United States to adopt that reform, to put in an, an oversight where an ombudsman and anyone living in Sweden will know that that's where that word comes from. Um, and it's an independent, completely independent investigation. Um, and in that case, it was, they said it was justified in terms of self-defense. Um, but the, the figure of one gives you an idea of how few deaths have resulted from before the peace agreement to after the peace agreement when those reforms were introduced. And we've recently had some shocking disturbances on our street, which you may have seen on CNN, with young people burning buses. Um, again, that was mainly in the hot spots, but not everywhere. And that's important to emphasize that there was good communication be between the police and youth workers and community workers in other pockets. And the resilience stood up. The investment in community and in policing and policing with the community all meant that the only spots that really got into the CNN's cameras were those on the peace line in that particular area. Um, so although it was disturbing for us to see a reoccurrence after all these years, of street violence, it's still important to emphasize that there was a really good practice between the police and local communities elsewhere. So reforms do work. Again, there were many, many of them in terms of quotas, in terms of institutions, the culture, um, new recruits, new badge, new uniform, um, which was very difficult in terms of symbols, as you will also understand the United States. Um, because people felt very wedded to the past. Um, but that was part of the transition. It was part of the transformation. Um, and I guess we could say that that was one of the models of success in our conflict transformation process. And we need to hold on to it, because recently the police again have been asked, are there, is there an engagement in treating communities differently? And interestingly, this time, it is the pro-union young people who are asking that question saying you used to be our police and now look what you're doing to us um, and i think that's a really interesting notion when you get to the situation where everybody and, and it was a settlement for all the people refer to our education system our police our housing system then you know you've got real change 
Thank you so much for that. And that kind of ties into my next question, which had to do with um, feminist movements in Ireland. So um, looking back, how do you think the work done by yourself in the, and the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition has impacted feminist movements in Northern Ireland? And at the time, did you think that um, your work would be changing the trajectory of women's movements in Northern Ireland, or were you and the other women in the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition more focused on the short-term goal of getting a peace agreement signed? Um, that was our short-term goal initially because it was quite something to break all the barriers and get to the table. We were the only two women in that room when we sat down that first day. Um, and that remained the case for the whole of the first year as, as negotiators. Um, but we also said that we are here to change um, the face of politics. And we wanted to build on that. We did come out of the feminist movement, the women's movement, but not all women in the coalition would have identified themselves as feminists. Some actually called themselves family feminists, um, which shows you, you know, the diversity of opinion. But that's important too. Um, and some were radical feminists, some were socialist feminists. You can't expect all feminists to think the same way. And because we came from a divided community, we had women who identified with pro-British union and unification of Ireland, and some who didn't identify as being either British or Irish. Um, so that was a tough coalition in terms of building consensus. But the wonderful thing about it was that the women had worked in the women's movement and knew that building consensus was really important. Um, and it was a way to get good decisions. It might take longer. Um, and we did last for 10 years. I was elected to the first assembly after the peace talks. Um, and then I lost my seat in 2003 because the um, assembly had collapsed. The spirit had been dragged out of the, the agreement and people felt they needed to go back to their main tribes, which is also what happens in conflict societies. Um, but that didn't mean the coalition disappeared. We went back to, you know, policy making, um, legislation, changes demanding those um, and you know again working with women in other conflict societies waging peace wherever we could um, and we're, I'm, as, I'm as involved today as I was 23 years ago in the legacy issues and disbanding paramilitaries in the whole issue of working alongside the police in terms of those reforms and in the women's movement a movement doesn't disappear um, and the women are passing on the baton and it's my hope the next generation of young women will pick, be there to pick it up. So we, we also have a women's party in Britain. And it's known as the Women's Equality Party. And we've been making connections with them. And there's a, a women's parliamentary caucus in Ireland across the aisle, the political aisle. And we've been making connections with them. So it's all about spreading your influence through networks. Those networks were there before we were elected. How do you get elected? You get elected because you've done the work in the previous years. And we built on what we had uh, succeeded in doing in the women's movement. And that's how we got to the t Within six weeks, some thought we fell out of the clouds and came from nowhere. And we said, <laughs> no, the women were there working in the front line. Um, we would have had a much worse conflict if they hadn't been uh, because they were the mediators and facilitators, and now we said we'll be the negotiators. Um, and so those are the multiple roles and multitasking that women still do. Peace is an unfinished business. Um, you don't walk away from it. Um, and, you know, they were ordinary women. I describe us as accidental activists. We accidentally fell into the peace negotiations, and um, we stayed. In extraordinary times, you end up doing very extraordinary things. And it's very important to have that presence. Very important for women to be present. Very important for women to be deliberators. We have a gender, uh, specific concerns. Things happen to women that don't happen to men. Um, and it's very important that we are also role models for the next generation. That you can look at that table and say, yeah, I could do that. Um, I love the way in the United States that you're given such encouragement from such an early age and to believe that anything's possible. That isn't the same culture that I grew up in. Um, and therefore, it was really important for our younger women and men to see 
that you can break through into these places and spaces that are very high level. And they're known as the track one diplomacy, track one negotiations. And if you don't have women in those places, it'll be much harder to resolve conflict and it'll be much harder to sustain conflict. And what we did when we got into track one was we looked over our shoulder and said, we came up from the grassroots, let's not forget that. And let's build our movement by going back every day and checking out with the grassroots movement that we're doing the right thing by them and that they see themselves in what we're saying and then in the actual final agreement. And we did the same with the track two, which is the trade unions, the businesses, the faith community. And we it was hard work to maintain all that. Um, but you know what? Women are used to doing that. When there's a row breaks out in the family, it's the women who reach out and say, right, let's start talking here. Let's keep the lines open. Let's keep the communication going. And so the skills that we learned were just uh, more polished, let's say, than what we were doing inside the women's movement and in the community movement. Um, and that's why we said that it was much easier for us to act as in this inclusive civic dialogue space. And that was what we focused on in terms of talking to our opponents, the back channels, that no one else would talk to some of those men and the other parties. And we said, OK, that's not good enough. You're a better negotiator for knowing who you're negotiating with. Um, and that's what we decided. And we didn't mind making uh, it known that we were perhaps not as experienced as the others. And in showing that, it didn't mean you had a lack of confidence. You were, much, you were just more honest. And that's why we reached out. Um, and as a result, we got called a lot of names and we were insulted. And it was very difficult and sometimes dangerous for us to be in those spaces. Um, because others felt very, um, they felt that we shouldn't have been doing it. That we were murking the waters and muddling things up. Um, and again, that's what women do. Um, and we didn't pay much attention to what we were being called. If we felt it was the right thing to do, we went out and did it. Um, but as a result, and now everyone says, you must talk to your opponents. But that wasn't the case when we first sat down. So for all of those reasons, it's extremely important to have progressive women at the table, women who want to change um, and make a change um, for the better. Um, and they're not, not all women are in that bracket. Um, some are very conservative um, and some want you to stay in your house and stay in your role um, and not break down that particular um, image that is so strong in so many cultures. And, but we said that if we're going to transform this society, then we need to transform the attitudes towards women in this society. I think that Runa also had a question regarding women's involvement in um, present day politics. So I'll hand it over to Runa. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, we've looked a little bit in the past. So speaking now, and especially in terms of recent events in Northern Ireland, uh, serving as a reminder of the fragility of the peace process. You mentioned this earlier also in combination with Northern Ireland's assembly election next year and potential constitutional change in like a Brexit. Um, what are important aspects to consider for women's inclusion and rights moving forward uh, now? Well, potentially we're looking at a perfect storm and it needs very judicial and very careful handling. Um, we've got a lot of anniversaries this year. It's the partition of Ireland after 100 years. Um, and it's good to see the role of women being acknowledged which was hidden, written out of history. Um, the wonderful women of, the role that women played a um, hundred years ago. And it's great to see the historians recovering that role. Um, likewise, that's the centenary that I'm talking about. This past week and weeks, we've had the 40th anniversary of the hunger strikes, which you may remember that 10 men died in prison, starving. Um, and became a, a, you know, brought a lot of international attention. Well, that's the 40th anniversary, and we've had to handle that very carefully. 
Um, it's the 50th anniversary of internment without trial. Um, internment means that you're not having a trial. Um, it's a breach of human rights. Um, and so that is a concern in terms of how that will be handled. Because, you know, in any conflict society commemorations and memorialization, as you've seen in the United States, um, can be a, a difficult issue um, in terms of how one side or the other views those particular events. Um, but more importantly, in relation to the upcoming assembly vote, which is next year and elections, as you've just had, um, often divide a country. Um, and so we're concerned about people falling back into silos. And there is also going to be um, a decision in a few years' time about the protocol, um, and a vote will be taken on that again. And the issue of the census is this year, 2021, and everyone's talking about the demographic changes. But also sensible people are saying we shouldn't be talking about how um, the, the politics of the cradle, in other words, counting how many babies are born in order to change the referendum results, if you understand me. Because if we do have a vote on the referendum, which some are pushing for as a result of Brexit, because they wish to remain European and perhaps are believing and unification is the only way to do that. And so that is one of the most contentious issues of all, which is when will that referendum be called? And in all of that, there are women who are still in the peace building mode, who are trying to open up the civic dialogue along with their men, friends and politicians and saying, let's handle this in a way that is sensitive to people's interests. And we cannot afford to have a reoccurrence of the terrible conflict that I lived through for 30 years. So how do you bring a different lens to that? Um, and that's where women have become very active and remained active. Even in the recent disturbances on the street, there were women out trying to calm it down, grabbing those young fellas by the scruff of the neck and saying, get back home. I'm not going to be the mother visiting you in prison. Um, and youth workers, many of whom were women, walked the streets day and night, all during that period, and continue to do so. Um, and that's been the, a very positive sign of the investment that we have made, um, because they are the peers, a peer group of those young people. Um, they're able to speak their language, can see how they identify with some of these issues. And COVID also had its impact on kids being bored and thinking it was great to get involved in recreational rioting. Um, but, you know, you pay a very high penalty. So I kept saying it's not prisons or police that we want those young people looking at. Um, they need to have a different aspiration in terms of training and equality and opportunities. Um, and that's what we're paying our attention to and to education under achievement. You have that issue too in the States where kids have very little literacy and very little numeracy and don't have an aspiration to get what you've just got, which is your master's in political science and your degree in arts. And those are the kids that need to be given that opportunity. Um, and, and women know this. We're also advocating integrated education. I think you probably understand that in the States where Catholic and Protestant children are educated together under the same roof. Um, we're advocating that we have more shared housing, social housing, public housing, uh, where people live alongside each other instead of segregated communities. Um, and we also, into the peace agreement, we put resources for community development um, and for diversionary programs for young people to take them away in the summer um, to what I think you call retreats. Um, we call um, residentials and, you know, to make sure that they get to those summer camps or they get to see other opportunities and the very disadvantaged communities in which they're currently living. And they, they, it's not, you know, it's not dissimilar to Southside Chicago, where I lived for a period. Um, it's the same issue. And that's what I'm, my work on disbanding paramilitaries is about is making sure they don't become the next generation of rich, rich pickings, as we would call it, the low-hanging fruit for those gangs or those organised uh, criminals or those, some of which are paramilitaries.
Um, and that's the hangover from the conflict. So for all of that reasons, and, and women are as active as that, um, as, as the guys, but the guy, and mostly it's men. I'm the only woman on that commission. There are four of us. And I keep saying to all of these peace building bodies and everywhere, where are the women? Where are the women? Look around the table. Do you see a young person here? Do you see a woman here? You're talking about them. So if you're going to put them on the table for discussion, make sure they're around the table as part of that discussion. Otherwise, it's just paternalism. We know best what is for you. And so women quite rightly say nothing without us as far as, and, and without us. And so we shouldn't have to constantly be banging at the door demanding to be let in. Peace building is about looking at who has the skills, who has been doing this, who knows the eyes and ears and conscience of the local community. Um, and that's really important for post-conflict. Thank you for that. That was a great, very great answer. Very great question also, Runa. I know we've been talking a lot about um, looking forward, looking ahead in Ireland. And now we actually have a question from Gia specifically regarding the future of Ireland and the future of women in Ireland. So Gia, just take that away. Yeah, so Monica, I loved how you're talking about the inclusion of, of all voices at the table. And my question um, is, do you think that the Women's Coalition um, or another all women's party could ever be reinstated? And if so, what do you think the party's platform would be? There, there are all women's um, coalitions at the minute. Um, both in the United Kingdom, as I said, because they are pretty frustrated at not seeing themselves in the main parties. Um, and likewise, um, in the Republic of Ireland, um, it's a very big question. And do you know what I'd, I'd say to you, Gia, is this, um, our moment was unique in many ways. There was a window of opportunity. I called it a constitutional moment with ceasefires and the potential for multi-party talks. And the, we women had done enough work on the ground to know that we could form a party and perhaps get elected. And we weren't even sure that we would get elected in those six weeks. But we said we'll make our mark by putting the pressure on the other parties to put women at the table. Um, and, and they didn't at the time because they didn't even think that we would get elected. Now they do. And so it's that contagion effect. That when So that's really why it's important sometimes to form your own group, to put the pressure on others, to say, well, this is what it looks like, or this is what we're asking you to do. And if you don't do it, we'll go out and do it ourselves. Um, and so that's what we did. We claimed the space. Nobody invited us. And nobody said, we think your ideas are great. Come on in, join us. And so sometimes you just have to claim that space. Um, and as a result of doing it, success breeds success. Today, we have women leaders as in our political parties. Um, and the percentage of women are, is growing inside those parties. But look at the United States. You also have a long way to go. Um, and, you know, again, you are particularly focused on merit. Um, but does merit treat everyone equally? And who gets to have those opportunities? It, ten, it tends to be people with advantages and privilege and, or someone has actually believed in them enough to give them that space. So uh, an alternative to that is to be more affirmative. And that you can either do by starting your own group or party and become a vanguard action. And perhaps you'll get enough votes to get elected. And people said to us, you should stand down that women's coalition and become a people's coalition. Um, we didn't want to do that. We had stayed as a women's coalition and we said we will decommission ourselves as a women's coalition. And when the time came, we did. But it didn't mean we went away. We are as active, as I said, in policy making um, and legislative changes as we ever were. So you just find different strokes for different folks. And that goes for women too. Thank you so, so much, Monica, for your time. I feel like I've learned so much um, in this short amount of time, just not only about Northern Ireland, but lessons that we can take back to the U.S. Um, and so we would just like to thank you so much for your time. 
You're more than welcome. Didn't it fly? <laughs>